love, and your emotional body. Passion generated from our emotions over the course of human history has fueled the greatest creations and advances on the planet, and it also has been employed to perpetrate some of the greatest atrocities. Like nuclear energy, emotional energy is comprised of adamantine particles that must be directed with the guidance of love to fulfill our purpose. This class is about how we do this. Now, some spiritual traditions seem to advocate eliminating feelings and desires. Some psychological approaches seem to advocate unfettered expression of feelings and fulfillment of desires for optimal health. Not too difficult to get confused, if not downright frustrated, in working with our own emotional system without a proper operating manual. Yes, we do have the accumulated wisdom of the ages, and we are continually discovering more about how our physical system is wired around emotions. I'm suggesting we chart a course in this class that helps us use past experience and new discoveries to integrate our emotional intelligence, EQ, with our intellectual intelligence, IQ, in the most effective and elegant way we can do right now. When passion and clarity are working together, they are unstoppable. When I'm full of passion without much clarity, watch out! Things could fly off in any direction. When I am precise and focused, but without emotional juice, I can sputter along and never get off the dime. <laughs> so let's start with some basic premises. The emotional energy field, which I am calling the emotional body, is only as good or useful to me as my intentions and expertise in directing and integrating it into my life purpose. Ignoring or suppressing it has not had a great track record towards the goal of integration. The body is hardwired with fear responses to certain stimuli which are potentially harmful. We are all descendants of people who did not get eaten by the tiger or fall off a cliff. As Daniel Gilbert in Stumbling on Happiness cites, the body reactions to dangerous stimuli have been shown through exacting research to be activated milliseconds before any cognitive activity takes place in our brain. Natural fear is evolutionarily useful in living organisms. Humans, however, have evolved a prefrontal cortex which can override the inhibitory reflexes that most mammals have that terminate fight-and-flight reactions once the perceived danger is passed. So we can keep our fear responses activated indefinitely even when there is no imminent danger. We call this anxiety, which, when carried too far, is labeled as a neurotic condition. That is, it's significantly impeding our functioning in life. Now, we also have pleasure centers in our brain, which are activated by dopamine and other hormones. The human brain is actually more wired for pleasure than for pain. When our capacity for physical pleasure is not integrated with social and spiritually fulfilling systems, yes, as mentioned last class, there's a center in the brain wired for compassion. Then we can substitute the physical pleasures for more integrated pleasures, which if carried too far, we call addiction. When rats in an experimental lab were electronically self-stimulated in this pleasure center by pressing a mechanical bar, they would continue to press the bar foregoing water, food, or any other necessities of life until they died. This is how strong unintegrated appetitive centers in our brain can be to which anyone who has gone deeply into addiction can attest. Again, as we saw in last class, if we view the human as just a composite of neural programs in the brain without any connection to spirit, integration is pretty much a crapshoot. The same is true for our emotional center, the heart. If it's just a physical organ taking its directions from the fight-flight centers in the midbrain, we are seemingly at the mercy of our environment. If we impute the presence of the spiritual component of the heart 
We can more easily understand the loving intention behind all our emotional responses, as well as the fear-based survival motives that can direct them. For example, fear can be defined as life energy with the perception, I can be hurt. From a loving context, this can help me to avoid cars while crossing the road, or not eat food left on a park bench, or not go home with that stranger in a trench coat. From a neurotic context, this can keep me from walking outside at all, eating anything that's not been boiled for 30 minutes, and treating everyone as hostile threats. Sadness can be defined as life energy with the perception I'm missing something. From a loving perspective, this can let me grieve the loss of a loved one, but connect with the love we shared and carry that forth into other loving relationships. From a neurotic stance, I can withdraw from all loving contact and see myself as permanently deprived. Anger can be defined as life energy with the perception I'm not getting what I want. With the eyes of love, this can propel me to find opportunities and take appropriate action to produce greater satisfaction for the good of all. From a neurotic position, it can induce me to see and try to eliminate others as obstacles to my getting what I want in a hostile and destructive ways. Gladness can be defined as life energy with the perception I'm in harmony. From a loving perspective, this can be inclusive and not attached to any particular form, object, or state. From a neurotic position, I'll try to grasp this person or object and try to preserve it from loss or interference. Holy vision allows me to apprehend both loving and neurotic perspectives of my emotions and choose the course that promotes the highest for me and all concerned. As such, my emotional body has a subtle kind of intelligence that gives color, nuance, and aliveness that cognitive intelligence does not. Our heart, when held as a physical and spiritual guide, then has desires that take me way beyond survival and the illusions of threat and deprivation into the realms of genuine thriving.